Hello, this is Abigail Gray. I'd like to welcome you to this week's Research Minutes, the CIPRI Knowledge Hub's weekly podcast where we interview researchers about the latest work being done in the field to help improve education. This week, I speak with Janet Rosenbaum, Assistant Professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at SUNY Downstate School of Public Health, about her study, Educational and Criminal Justice Outcomes 12 Years After School Suspension. Her work was published last month in Youth and Society. Janet, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. I am a researcher here at the Consortium for Policy Research and Education, and I study school climate and discipline. And I I led a team that recently released a study of disciplinary practices and suspension here in the School District of Philadelphia. In in addition, um, I'm funded partly through a fellowship from the Stonely Foundation. And in that capacity, I work closely with the School District of Uh, Philadelphia on the implementation of evidence-based practices for improving school climate and disciplinary practice. So I was very intrigued when I saw this recent study in the journal um, uh, Youth and Society. You're an epidemiologist. That's not always the case with folks who are studying um, school issues such as suspension. What draws you to to be interested in studying suspension and suspension outcomes? During my uh, PhD program uh, in uh, public health policy at Harvard, I focused on adolescent health, uh, particularly on uh, abstinence-based sex education. And I went on to study sex education um, during a summer internship at the Rand Corporation and also my postdoc in sexually transmitted infections at Johns Hopkins. And sex education definitely gives adolescents crucial information about safe sex that they need to know and they might not learn otherwise from their parents or from society. But it's also a really small part of adolescents' overall health. And education as a broad spectrum of experiences has a much bigger influence on adolescents' life outcomes. And it's really a fundamental determinant of health, and it's, it's really been understudied in terms of health outcomes. During my postdoc, I applied for and received grants from the Spencer Foundation and from the American Educational Research Association to study two groups of adolescents and young adults who are really at the margins of the educational system. So they might be allowed to fall through the cracks if things weren't better for them. And these were adolescents who were suspended from school and young adults who enter community college because community college has very poor completion rates. Suspension was particularly interesting for me to study because the U.S. really changed its approach to suspension during the same years that it happens to be a a large federally funded nationally representative survey of adolescents was collected. That that is the Ad Health study. The mid-1990s when the initial waves were collected, it happened to be a peak of, of crime and violence, both in society and in schools. And there was a real strong feeling that government needs to do something to stop the violence and specifically to stop children from bringing weapons to school. Sure. And the so, Gun Free Schools Act. Yeah. Yeah. So the Gun Free Schools Act re- required states to adopt zero tolerance suspension policy. And this type of zero tolerance policy expanded enormously so that any child who had not only had a weapon, but illegal drugs, would be required to be suspended for a full year. And then states and localities passed their own policies for things like insubordination that could be racially biased and possession even of over-the-counter medications like ibuprofen. And Mm -hmm. so now we're at a state where a third of students are suspended over the course of a K-12 school career. So I wanted to study suspension just because there had been such a radical uh, change at a time when I happened to have data and I happened to have a lot of health data specifically. So tell me a little bit about that study. How does it complement or build on some of the other studies of suspension that are out there? Previous studies uh, looked at short-term outcomes for the most Mm -hmm. part and Most previous studies used regression-based analysis where the only adjustment for uh, selection into suspension was with uh, regression methods, which does some adjustment but is not really enough to take care of um, all the vast differences that might differ between people who are suspended and people who are not suspended. There's been, there was a critique actually 
of this when um, an economist did a study of suspension and found no effect and concluded that all previous studies were explained solely by selection into suspension. And so using um, the statistical method that I use allows me to make sure that it's really suspension that's differing and the only main difference that that, that is explaining what's coming out because someone could just look at uh, suspend, suspension and say, well, these are bad kids. They would have bad outcomes no matter what. And um, it's not suspension. It's that, you know, it's that they would have bad outcomes no matter what. And so this, I found um, non-suspended adolescents who didn't differ on 60 characteristics that might otherwise explain why somebody's suspended and somebody else isn't, and still suspended students had worse outcomes. That's really interesting. Can you say a little bit about what some of those 60 characteristics were? The uh, traits that predicted a greater likelihood of suspension included higher delinquency overall, um, a higher uh, depression score on a standardized measure of depression, uh, reporting weekly problems, finishing homework, having a father who'd been in prison, and having friends who engage in more risk behaviors. Um, those were um, those predicted a greater chance of suspension. And then there were traits that I matched on that predicted lower likelihood of suspension that included factors like higher household incomes, higher test scores, higher grade, higher grades, higher school attachment, attending a private school rather than the public school and also having parents who graduated college. So in other words, if I hadn't matched on these, I could... I could see why you would say, why someone might say that the suspended kids were likely to have worse outcomes because they do start out with worse, um, they do start out with a likelihood of having poor outcomes. But I was able to match on these and a total of 60 characteristics. So in other words, your uh, group that ultimately did receive suspension and your group that never were suspended started out on exactly the same track in terms of those characteristics. That's exactly right. We, we obviously couldn't do a randomized experiment where you randomly right. apply some students to be suspended and some not to be suspended. But this match sampling method allows us to approximate what a randomized experiment would look like so that once the groups are completely similar on so many characteristics, what remains is that they are arbitrarily Um, Some are arbitrarily suspended and some aren't, and you couldn't tell the difference ahead of time based on these characteristics. So in the absence of being able to actually randomize students to receive a suspension or not, which clearly is not something that can be done or should be done, um, you conducted a really rigorous quasi-experiment with baseline equivalence, which allows you to be able to, to draw a really causal inference as a result of the design of this study. Which I think, as you're, as you're mentioning, in my experience, um, a lot of the prior research on suspension um, was susceptible to criticism. Not all, but some was susceptible to criticism because um, it wasn't possible to say that there was a causal link between the suspension and the poor outcomes down the road. That's correct. So you had these, ma- you had these matched groups of kids who did and did not ultimately receive suspensions, and you um, you followed them for a number of years. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looked like and what you learned? We, we matched uh, students on their pre-suspension characteristics, and then they were suspended sometime between 1995 and 1996, and then they were surveyed again five years later and 12 years later after suspension. And comparing the suspended and non-suspending suspended young adults, Uh, we saw that suspended youth had worse educational outcomes. They were more than twice as likely to have been expelled within five years. And this is a group of people who had no prior disciplinary record, by the way. Everybody had no prior disciplinary record. So the fact that they were more than twice as likely to have been expelled is, is very remarkable. They were slightly less likely to have received a high school diploma, both five and 12 years later. It was 8% 8% and 6% decrease, which is substantial given how important a high school diploma is just as a minimal marker for life outcomes. And they were also 24% less likely to have earned a BA after 12 years. 
a suspended youth also had much more involvement in criminal the, the criminal justice system. They were about 40% more likely to have been arrested after five years and also after 12 years. And they're about four times as likely to have been convicted while a minor within five years. And they were also almost 50% more likely to have been on probation. There, it shows that, there, that the cr earlier criticisms of school suspension that uh, says that school suspension is the first step on a school to prison pipeline really has something to it that even after matching on um, these 60 characteristics, the uh, suspended youth may be, seem to be on, on this path of school to prison. Based on your research, what roles do racial disparities play in the issue of, of school suspension? Zero tolerance school suspension policy sounds fair as if everybody's going to be treated the same and held against the same standards. But in fact, the zero tolerance policies ended up punishing children that were already vulnerable to poor school outcomes, such as disadvantaged racial minorities and disabled children, far more than other children. So for instance, in the 1970s, 6% of black children were suspended each year, which was twice the rate for white children. But 30 years later, in 2006, 15 percent of black children were suspended each year, which was three times the rate for white children. So the, the suspension gap widened after these policies were enacted. Um, specifically in my study, which was drawn from a nationally representative sample of adolescents, I found that black and Latino students were more likely to have been suspended than white students. And incidentally, this is limited to students with no discipline history at all. These are people who have never been suspended, never been expelled. And um, black and Latino students were more likely to be suspended than white students. And interestingly enough, I found that tall black males were even more likely to be suspended than any other group. They were more likely to be suspended than short black males, whereas height didn't predict the likelihood of suspended either for black females or in the general population. And so this association with height for black males, but not for any other group, suggests that teachers and administrators are perceiving black males differently than other groups. And they may be allowing racial prejudice to influence their uh, punishment decisions. And this goes along with a randomized experiment that was done by some psychologists that presented teachers and administrators with vignettes, and they showed them each vignette next to a picture of a hypothetical student that happened to be either black or white, and the black hypothetical students were punished more severely in these this randomized experiment than the white hypothetical students, suggesting that the perception of racial bias in school suspension is, is very real. That's really striking. Those are some very um, alarming statistics, certainly. Any things that you, you wanted to sort of highlight in terms of the implications of this work for policy or for practitioners? The U.S. suspension policy was formed in the mid-1990s at a time that there were a lot of other tough-on-crime laws that brought us to where we are now, that we have such high incarceration rate, especially impacting black families. And the U.S. is already uh, reconsidering a lot of these policies under the Obama administration, the Office of Civil Rights, and the Department of Education documented substantial school suspension disparities. And as you mentioned, in Philadelphia, there have been, it's been similar around the country that both that federal, state, and also local efforts have tried to reduce school suspension. Um, in New York State, for example, um, preschool students, suspension for preschool students has been banned. So there are all these isolated efforts, but suspension is still high even after all these efforts, and we need even more efforts to uh, decrease suspension. I mean, we've, we've been building these policies for decades and decades on top of, you know, centuries of injustice, and it's, uh, we're in a very deep hole. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, it's not just for school suspension, but for just a, an entire system. So, I mean, as a society, we need to stop digging and we need to fill in the hole. And my research can only give a negative prescription. Out-of-school suspension isn't improving adolescents' outcomes, and it seems to be worsening them. I thought maybe it was the fact that kids were being pushed out of the school building. So I looked at in-school suspension to see whether that was any better, because at least the kids aren't at home on the streets 
um, at their own uh, discretion of what to do. And I found that it wasn't any better, that the in-school suspended students were also had poor outcomes. The American Association of Pediatrics, in their policy brief, on uh, school suspension recommends positive behavior intervention supports. And I know that there are a lot of other uh, youth researchers that can recommend specific positive behavior interventions. A lot of the work that, that my team is involved with is focused on PBIS, positive behavior intervention support, and the sort of um, benefits and challenges of that as, as a potential or partial remedy to the issue. Well, thank you so much for joining us for the, this conversation. Your research, I think, is really important and exciting, and I'm, I'm glad to have had a chance to chat with you a little bit. Thanks for having me today. I want to just thank everybody for listening to Research Minute. And to subscribe to the weekly podcast and listen to more interviews, head to soundcloud.com. And for li- the latest videos, podcasts, and discussion updates, follow us on at Hub on Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.